Catherine Truitt is the Republican nominee for state superintendent of public instruction. She joins us now to discuss the 2020 campaign. Welcome to the program and thanks for uh, coming before all us voters out there in North Carolina. Absolutely. Thank you, Kelly. I'm thrilled to be here. Well, it's a unique campaign season. What brings you into the race? What keeps you in it? Um, how are things going out there? Yeah, that's great. I've never heard somebody say what keeps you in it. I love that. <laughs> um, so I, I decided to run um, about 18 months ago because I, I know deep down that the surest pathway to opportunity and to success in this great country is still education. And I know from having spent my entire adult life working in education that we're not educating all students. Um, and there are many big picture um, items that I would love to be able to work on at the state level that will improve outcomes, not just for all students, but for teachers as well. Which kids are not being educated? Um, I'll tell you this, most. So 65% of all eighth graders in North Carolina start high school not reading and doing math proficiently. And when we break that down into subgroups, we see that about 18% of Hispanic students do not. I'm sorry, only 18% do. And only 14% of African American eighth graders read and write on grade level going into ninth grade. Is that, does that fall under, under the title of systemic problem? Yes, it does, um, but it's not just about money because we see that um, this applies not just to low-income kids. This is across the board. Now, we do know that um, achievement gaps by race and by income have not moved in this state since the 90s. No matter how much money we've spent um, or not spent, these uh, gaps have remained the same. So we need to do things differently because what we've been doing for the past 30 years uh, doesn't work. What would work? So the first thing that we need to do with the literacy piece is to implement a statewide initiative that will train teachers who are al already teaching on what's known as the science of reading. And this is um, uh, decades of research that culminated in the National Reading Panel's Five Pillars of Reading, and this is all fancy talk for a phonics-based approach to early literacy instruction, not whole language and not balanced literacy, which is what about 65% of our teachers are being trained to do. So we need to work with the colleges of education to make sure that teachers are being shown research back methods of early instruction, and we need to train our current teachers. Mississippi did this five years ago, laser focused on early literacy. They were the only state in 2019 to show significant reading gains in, across all groups. Where do you fall in the whole idea of uh, some issues should be state focused in education, some should be local decisions? So um, by and large, I am 100% local control. So local control for me means that the superintendent uh, in that school district, by the way, we have 115 very different school districts in our state, uh, each with varying needs. The superintendent, the um, local health officials in the case of COVID, local school boards, parents and, their, and, um, and teachers in that community need to be the people making the decisions. Elections and, and elected officials come and go. Initiatives come and go when, the, when, when we have educated folks, um, it, you know, um, I'm sorry, elected folks in education. Mm -hmm. We need the stability of local control. And also those folks are the people who know their communities best. They know their students and their families. They know how to match resources to needs best. And so I just think that's all around good policy. So if you're elected state superintendent of public instruction, you're joining the state board of education. And that's who has a lot of power in the state over the schools. So how do you convince them to go along with your plans? So I, I think that um, as I, I will report to the State Board of mm -hmm. Education and I will lead the Department of Public Instruction, which is carrying out the duties and the tasks as, as assigned by the State Board of Education and the legislature. And so I think that when you work with any board, there has to be mutual respect, understanding and listening. Um, you need to ass assume the best and take no offense and recognize that folks who serve on the school board want to do so because 
of their commitment to education. This is two days out of their month for uh, with, with very little remuneration, and it's a big, big time, um, it takes a lot, a, a lot of their time. And so, you, as anyone does when they report to a board, they have to be able to work with that board. I'm a consensus builder. Um, I worked in the McCrory administration. I build a reputation for myself of reaching across the aisle, and that's exactly what I plan to do. I was looking through your website. You're proposing a highly qualified teacher, quote unquote, in every classroom in North Carolina. Every parent thinks they have a highly qualified, or, or seems to give a fair shake to that teacher that they get every single year. How do you know, just as a parent, whether you have a highly qualified teacher or just a competent one? Yeah, so I actually would disagree okay. with that. I, I think, I think that, um, I think it's very, as a former teacher, I think it's very difficult for parents to really understand what teachers go through mm -hmm. each day in the classroom. And um, I think that we're seeing now uh, certainly across social media, parents really, for the first time, starting to understand exactly what a teacher has to do each and every day. Um, we're on our third generation of school effectiveness research across the country. And what we know is that the, it's not the curriculum, the, the furniture in the school, the seating arrangements, those things are not what moves the needle with kids. It's having a highly qualified teacher. And what that means is a teacher who um, understands how to have high expectations with students, scaffold or help those students who need extra help, assess in a way that is ongoing, provides continual feedback, communicates with parents. Um, you know, teachers leave the profession because of working conditions. And um, what there are a lot of things that fall under the umbrella of providing a highly qualified teacher. Teacher pay is one of them. I would love for North Carolina to be first in the Southeast in teacher pay. We've come a long way since 2010, since the, since the recession, when, when I taught in Johnston County, my pay was frozen. Um, so we've, we've really come a long way in those rankings. Um, and I saw something the other day that said that uh, we are fourth in the Southeast. I wanna be first in the Southeast. What do you think t what parents are thinking about this current situation we're in? We're they think they may go to school, then the school remains closed. We go virtual. Some rural counties are doing either open or hybrid. Um, what do you say to parents out there? And if you're the superintendent, whether or not you can control anything about it, they're going to yeah. ask you about it. Yeah, that's exactly right. Uh, so my position from the start has been local control. I would have much preferred to see the governor support D local superintendents, local health officials in looking at local infection rates and determining through guidance from the Department of Health and Human Services what should exactly happen in, in our very disparate communities. So um, what, what works in Yancey County is not going to work in Wake County and what works in Wake County is not going to work in Fayetteville even. So. Um, you know, this is there. There, there is no one size fits all for school opening, and um, if if I am elected, when I start in January, I will definitely be advocating for local control. Uh, you run a, a nonprofit online university, Western Governors University of North Carolina. So I've never talked to anyone so powerful in the online learning space. What can you say to parents out there who have their child right now sitting in front of a computer doing essentially what adults are doing voluntarily yes. to get their college degree? Is it a fair comparison? Do you have any tips for us out there? Yeah, so it's not a fair comparison. Um, every piece of research out there is clear that students need to be in the classroom with their students. And I certainly would not advocate for, um, for ongoing online instruction for the vast majority of students. Um, my, my, my tips are these. Um, keep your children reading. Keep them engaged in some kind of critical thinking, no matter what that is. Provide as many experiences as you can. Not everybody can do that, but um, if, if you can give them some different kinds of, exp my, my children uh, work and they have expanded their work hours because they're not really in school the, the, the full day. Um, so yeah, I, 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 I think that um, if kids continue to read, they're gonna be okay. What I worry about when I think about all kids across the state is that there are so many children who are going to be 
even further behind than they already were when this pandemic started. And uh, teachers have an enormous task in front of them to get these kids caught up. Would it be possible to even get them caught up or just get them in position to just move forward with life? So I do think it's possible to get them caught up. It's going to take significant investment from the legislature in terms of um, professional development for students. There are some things that we can do differently. Competency-based education is something that many other states are looking at. That's the idea of mastery-based learning where kids cannot progress until they've mastered the concept. And we even have a school in Raleigh that, that does this, a middle school. Um, I would love to see us think about moving in that direction. If you win, you would be a Republican and you possibly, and likely by statistics, be joining a legislature or working with a legislature that's Republican controlled, but you worked for Pat McCrory and we know how those budget dealings were back I in do. those days. I do, I do. So what do, uh, you know, to get back on business here, how well do you get along with the leaders there? Because not much has changed except the governor. Yeah, so a uh, very good point. Um, I, I have very good relationships with people on both sides of the aisle, not just from my time with Pat McCrory, but I also worked for President Spellings in the UNC system for a time. And then with WGU, we are advocating for our students at the legislature, and um, I've done so on both sides of the aisle. Um, I, I think that working with the legislature, in my experience, means coming with data in hand. I will tell you that um, the state of Massachusetts spends probably twice what we do per pupil uh, in, uh, in, in K-12 education, but they have the third worst achievement gap in the country. And so I want to be very careful with the um, asks that the Department of Public Instruction and the school board will be making of the legislature. We need to... Um, not throw good money after bad. We need to be very deliberate and very careful careful about how we spend um, education dollars. It's 40% of our budget. It's almost a $10 billion budget. And um, n not money's not always the solution. There are definitely some things where we do need to spend m more money. We need to spend more money on reading coaches. We need to spend more money on uh, increasing our ratios of school support personnel so that teachers can teach and not have to be giving kids insulin shots and doing the work of a social worker. Um, but to, to, to just advocate, oh, we're, we, we need to spend more money for the sake of spending more money is not going to fly with this legislature. Voters, that's Catherine Truitt. She's the Republican nominee for State Superintendent of Public Instruction in North Carolina. Thanks for your time in this interview. Appreciate you coming by. Thanks, Kelly.